Hey Buns, today we're gonna to talk about what are the most impressive things that you can flex with in Final Fantasy XIV. Now, things, it's intentionally vague because things can mean anything, really. It could be a mount, it could be a gear set, it could be a title, just anything that is very, very prestigious and impressive, something that it's clear just by looking at it that this guy no life the game or got insanely lucky or there's something else very special or notable about them that you can tell because they have this thing. It can't just be anything that took a long time and not just rare for the sake of being rare. It's gotta be more than that. Something that you look at and go, damn, this guy, like, get a load of this guy, but like, in a good way. Some major factors that I considered when compiling this list include determined efforts spent. So you had to kind of work towards it. Lasting achievements, not just something that's temporary, that's cool now, but maybe won't be so cool later. Like it's always gotta be cool. And recognizability, something that the majority of people, I guess people at Endgame, players have been playing a little while, they can recognize that and say, yes, that is cool. Wow, yep, that's because that's the thing that gives it prestige. Other people recognizing that it is cool. <laughs> Some examples of things that I left out, and here's why, uh, so something like the Amara. Yeah, it takes a while to get because it means you have to get all your battle jobs to 80. But for me, I was able to pretty lazily do it. And I think that if you just put enough time doing it, it's not very hard at all. So I don't think it meets the standard of super duper impressiveness. Mounts you get from clearing a savage tier, while impressive when the raid is new, don't retain that high status forever because later on you can unsync those raids, the gear gets better, echo gets added, and killing the bosses becomes trivial. So I think because of that, the mounts lose some of the wow factor they had when the raids were new. Similarly, you can unsync old trials, making them super easy while you farm for the trial mounts. So while it is cool to get those mounts and the meta mounts, I think that on unsynced, the bosses are pretty much just loot pinatas. So I think that does disqualify them from making my list of most impressivest things. As for minions, some of them are rare, but I think that the problem with minions is most people don't know which ones are rare. Like, I, I think that in compiling this list, the notoriety and the general understanding that the thing is rare matters a lot. It can't be overly niche that only minion collectors would know that this thing took you a long time. Rare for the sake of being rare isn't that good because there's a store mount that is actually <laughs> very rare according to FXV Collect but it's just rare because nobody wants to buy it. So like, rarity doesn't always equal goodity. Some of these things are more like categories because it just made more sense to do it that way. Uh, yes, this will be all colored by my personal opinions, but I would wager that all these things are things that most people would be very impressed by were you to flex them openly. Ultimate weapons, the ultimate flex. So these are from clearing the hardest content in the game. The yellow ones are from the unending coil of Bahamut ultimate, also known as Yukob, and it also gives the legend title. The blue ones are from the weapons refrain ultimate, also known as Uwu, which gives you the ultimate legend title. And the shiny ones with like the time machine stuff and the cogs all over it are, um, so, yeah, some of the cogs are pretty big too. You got some big cogs on some of these. Those are from the Epic of Alexander Ultimate, AKA T, which also gives the perfect legend title. When I first saw these weapons, I thought to myself, I will never be able to get one of these weapons. Like, this is way beyond me. This is a league far, far above what I am personally capable of. And that turned out to be not correct. You know, sometimes seeing things like this in the game, they make you strive for more. They make you want to be better. And uh, that's what these ultimate weapons represent to me. Having an ultimate weapon is proof that you are good at the game, or at least you were able to not be bad for a full 20 minutes. It's kind of more my situation. The Necromancer title. This would be awesome to have on Reaper, side note. <laughs> Similarly, the Lone Hero title, though let's be honest, Necromancer sounds way cooler. These are extremely rare titles that you get from soloing a deep dungeon. Necromancer is from House of the Dead and Lone Hero is from Heaven on High. What I wanna show you that I think will help you understand why this is so insane is this clip from Meiji. Now Meiji is the one that wrote the guide, like the guide for Pals of the Dead that I will link below. I'll also link to their Twitch below and their YouTube channel. Okay, just for some context, 
Palace of the Dead to clear it, to do the solo clear. You have to get to the final floor, which is floor 200. And as you progress through it, the floors get harder and harder and harder. And here's a clip of what it was like for one of the best Palace of the Dead players in the world to fight one mob, a mimic, on a very, very high floor, floor 192. So you can just look from this clip the level of kiting that is required. They're popping potions constantly. Like you cannot take more than one hit from this thing. Is This is without steel. So steel is a buff that you can get for yourself, but I mean, a lot of this is about luck. You might not have that buff available. You might not have looted the thing that you can use to get that buff for yourself. And in that case, you just need to use pure skill, pure kiting skill to survive the situation. And if you die, that's it. You, your run is over. Uh, so you have to make it from floor one to floor 200 solo, all on your own, to get the Necromancer title in Palace of the Dead. I actually managed to track down somebody on my data center who has both titles and cleared Palace of the Dead, not once, but three different times. It might've been more uh, than that because I talked to them at the end of June and he said he was still going for more clears then. So this is Sadie Sassafras on Lich. I was like, why? <laughs> why are you going for more clears? Like, why would you suffer more? You already have the title. And he said that he wanted to get back on the leaderboard for Machinist as his clear got pushed off. So yeah, there are rankings that you can check here. It is public for everyone to see. He also said that it's a good time sink and it is fun to go in on other jobs to see how they handle stuff in there. Like clearly he just enjoys the content itself. That's what keeps him coming back. He said that compared to something like Savage, a Deep Dungeon solo calls for a massive time commitment and it's just a huge personal responsibility. There's nobody else in there that can help you. And he said, it's nice knowing that if I mess up, it's on me. There's no chance of someone else ruining a run. Now, when I talked to Sadie a little while ago, he said that he had a scholar run sitting at 110, but I can already see here from the leaderboards that his scholar run is at 186, which is pretty impressive because some jobs like scholar are even harder to do on this than other jobs. So he's like added a new level of nightmare mode to something that's already a nightmare mode content, like just for the lulls, pretty much. Sadie also suggested that I give a shout out to Angelus Dimonos, whose name I actually did hear a week or two ago when I heard that Angelus had soloed Heaven on High on every single job. Sadie said that Angelus does streams that are like how to do Palace of the Dead from one to 200 that were helpful and puts his clears up on YouTube as well. So I'll link to all that in the description box. Definitely worth checking out if you're considering soloing. I also asked Sadie if there's anything else that he wanted to suggest to you buns who might be considering this. And he said, do not be disheartened if you die early on in the climb. The first few floors can be bad if you're under leveled in Palace or if you get ambushed by patrols and have it on high. I never played Machinist before trying out Solo Deep Dungeon and I managed to get there. So anybody else watching can't. I thought that was really crazy. <laughs> so like he didn't even, he wasn't even like a pro Machinist player. He didn't even play Machinist before doing this achievement. So that should be encouraging for some of y'all. Next up, rare PVP loot. So I've kind of put this all in one category because honestly, all PVP mounts are rare since <laughs> like so few people do the content. Though I kind of do feel like that is changing lately, but that's a, a subject for another day. I kind of wanted to focus more on all of the unobtainable PVP mounts that are super rare, like the feast rewards from getting top 100 in the feast in a previous season. Cause like once the season rewards are out, that's it. You can never get those rewards again. So it's a good reason to go do the feast while it's current. Sometimes the reward for feast top 100 is not a mount, but instead really cool armor sets, which was the case in season 18 and 19. The Samurai and my static Macopsy actually has this. And all the time, like every day. People even DM me on Twitter to ask where he got this armor because it's super cool and super rare. And I'm like, I mean, sorry, that ship has sailed. You should have done Feast season 18 or 19 because now uh, you cannot get it anymore. Best you can do is feast your eyes on it. Modeling these PVP mounts for me here today is Rasumi Himawari from Shiva, the top mount collector on my data center, according to FXV Collect. So I don't know how accurate it is, but Still pretty impressive. I asked her, assuming if they had to know life PVP to get top 100 for these mounts. 
And they actually said, no, nah, it's not even that bad. In most seasons, it takes like 30 to 50 hours of work. If you play like two to three hours every day, you can spread it out a lot. Y'all should know that season 20 of The Feast is underway right now. So if you want to fight me, <laughs> I mean, you can. I've been doing it. I've been doing it a good bit. It's the first time I've been ranking up in PvP. It's actually been pretty fun. But I bring it up because, not, not to tell you to fight me, but to tell you if you want the soon-to-be-rare mount from Season 20, the Dreadnought from ranking in the top 100 for this season, now would be the time to do the feast. You might dread not doing it. The Tiger mount. Also, the Triceratops mount from doing hunts. That's killing world bosses, basically. For the Tiger, you need to kill 3,000 A ranks and 2,000 S ranks, the S ranks being the brutal part, because they're often pretty difficult and weird to spawn. I know there are some S ranks that to get them to spawn, you need to go to their spawn location and just die repeatedly, like over and over and over, like maybe it'll spawn at some point. There's others that you need to go to their spawn location and eat, eat food or drink, and they might show up or maybe you need to catch a particular fish or maybe it just has to be during nights of the full moon like it, it sounds like a joke but yeah that's how a lot of these are so some of them are kind of pain in the ass the triceratops requires you to kill 2000 a rank elite marks and 1000 s rank elite marks in shadowbringers zones Rasumi, who has both of these mounts told me that they went hard for like six months to get these mounts and i was like when you say you went hard what does that entail? And they said S ranks can take up to 132 hours to respawn. You had three copies per zone at Shadowbringers launch and six servers with world travel. So you could get 50 realistically every three days and per week, something like 100. So yeah, 50 S ranks every three days or so for six months. They said they were in a Discord server for hunts and four different link shells to make sure they get all the call outs to be alerted when there's a hunt to go kill. And I do suggest you join those. I know Faloop has been an amazing resource for this, so I'll put the links to that below. Basically, if you want these mounts, the hunt is gonna become your end game. Like, that's, that's how you gotta earn your stripes. The Mentor Pegasus Mount, or the Astrope. This requires 2,000 mentor roulettes. Now that is a roulette that you can get access to if you're a PVE mentor, which means you've gotten 1,500 commendations, you've done 1,000 duties, and you have finished Crystarium role quests as a tank, a healer, and a DPS job. You also need to have completed every duty in the game, including Extreme Trials, is any of those can pop up in your mentor roulette with some exceptions being ultimate savage current expansion extreme trials and binding coils so the idea behind the mentor roulette is to send mentors into groups where their guidance and advice would be needed most so like groups of sprouts who maybe they're struggling maybe they just need someone there to give them a little help, right? AKA Serene on Reddit said of her experience getting this mount, people generally didn't want advice, didn't listen to advice if given, and sometimes even responded with hostility to tips, even if they were performing very poorly. So I learned to most of the time silently endure if duties weren't going well. Well, I do that already and I'm not even doing the mentor roulette. But they did say that in synced extreme fights, people were more receptive to advice. So, I mean, I guess, <laughs> getting your ass beat by a grandpa of the cabbage people uh, might teach you a little lesson in humility, yeah. They said that synced extremes counted for about 10% of the duties they completed towards their astrope amount. They said it always took a lot of time and effort and typically ran for the full 60 minutes. My clear rate for synced extremes was pretty decent. I took the time to type out and teach the fight mechanics almost every time I got queued into an extreme, and I would try to coach players who were struggling but played a crucial role in the fight. Many, if not most, teams were pretty receptive and understanding about needing to respect the mechanics. However, there were also many, many lost causes, times where no amount of instruction or guidance would be sufficient to get a team to clear. Now I asked Rasumi here about their experience getting this mount and they said I set aside like five months and did it all day until I was done. On good days I got around 60 to 80 roulettes and on bad days I got like 10. It really depends on the content you get on that day.
Sariba Yoko here also got the S-trope and told me that they had been doing it more casually, like five or 10 times a week. Sariba said, I only went in mentor roulette if I'm in a daddy mood. <laughs> Morble, the blue mage mount. So to get this one, you must be in a fully blue mage group with silence echo turned on and undersized party turned off. You have to do binding coil of Bahamut turn five, second coil of Bahamut turn four, final coil of Bahamut turn four, then in Alexander, burden of the father savage, burden of the son savage, and soul of the creator savage. Again, it cannot be unsynced. So that's one of the things that I think gives this mount the staying power. It's always cool because it will always require effort. I asked my friend Laramian, who you see here on the Morble, how they would rate the difficulty of these Blue Mage raids compared to doing the raid normally on Savage. And they said that in general, the Blue Mage Savages are a bit easier for Blue Mages as we can cheat mechanics, but it can vary. I said, if it's not that bad, then why don't we see more people doing it? Like. Is it just hard to find a blue man group? And they said, yeah, you need to go out and hunt down a group for it in Discord. I have recently seen a small trend of people gathering up in Party Finder, but they wait a long time. But who knows, in the time before Endwalker, there may be more blue mages doing it. The legacy stuff, that includes the legacy tattoo, the legacy gubu, or the legacy chocobo. So any proof that you played the game when it was ass, when everybody was like, don't play that game, it's not a good game. You were like, I'm not gonna listen to you. I'm gonna play that game anyway. Well, now you have cool stuff to show for it. According to this post on the FF14 subreddit, the game actually punished players who put any effort into playing it. If you earned too much XP, you got fatigue and basically you earned less and less XP until you earned zero. The only thing you could do was stop playing the game you paid for and was paying monthly for on top of that. The game actually punished you for playing it, which is just impressive. So the mount, the tattoo, and the chocobo are impressive because you've had to put up with an impressive amount of bullshit. I asked my friend here to tell me what 1.0 was like, and they said, I can't describe how many f***ing giant enemy crabs I killed in Lanasha to finally get high enough to go to Karthus. And then I went there, and it was f***ing empty. Like, literally nothing there. Just green hills and forests with occasional moms. There were like two or three hamlets across this gigantic map, and that's it. No quests, no nothing. The Legacy Chocobo is ultra rare because you had to not only play 1.0, but you had to pay for 90 days, like have a three-month sub that was active before the game ended, like before the end of 1.0. They basically promised people a chocobo that they would be able to ride after the game came back. But now that the game is good, how prestigious is it to have this ultra rare 1.0 loot? Well, one person <laughs> actually cried on Reddit. I, I thought this post was really funny. They said, jealousy of legacy players is making me <laughs> not want to play. Does anyone else feel the same? Does anyone have advice or a different way to think about it? <laughs> Look, imagine having something on your character that somebody else wanted so bad that they're ready to uninstall the game. Like they're just not even enjoying the game anymore because all they can think about is that thing that you have that they don't have. Like, wow. A mansion in a good spot. Honestly, getting a house at all is pretty big achievement in the current situation with housing, but getting a large house in a good spot, that is a rare opportunity. That's a door that doesn't open every day. But what is a good spot? Well, um, not facing any other houses. <laughs> I would think like on top of a cliff, maybe overlooking the, having a nice view. It's so funny because Palm 14 players are always like, we need neighborhoods so we can be around other players' houses. Okay, well, where's your house? Well, not in front of anyone else's house. They're gonna ruin it. <laughs> My view. So right now, yeah, because the housing system is terrible and there's nowhere near enough supply for the demand, it's extremely hard to get a house at all, as I said. I personally never seen a large house plot for sale ever, except like maybe when the residential district is brand new. So I think the people with the large plots probably got them when the ward opened or they were insanely lucky. Now they did confirm that in Endwalker they will be adding a lottery system, which believe it or not, the lottery will be more fair. If that gives you an idea of just how jacked the current system is. So if you really want a large house right now, uh, I would suggest go to a mansion that's owned by an FC and just knock on the door and ask if Daddy Warbucks will adopt you. The Gilsink Mounts, there are two of them, the 50 million Gil Mount. 
gilded mikoshi and the 25 million gil mount the golden vessel of ronka now my friend who has both of these said that they rarely use the ronka one because it's less fancy but people love the gilded mikoshi mount and they said they get positive comments on it all the time i even got invited to a g pose session once to provide the confetti for a party picture. They said that they had made a lot of Gil being an early adopter to the Bajja content, selling tons of fragments, and also selling mounts and minions from Unreal Trials. I asked, did it break the bank for you to buy it? Or was this like pocket change for you? Right, I basically asked like, are you rich? And they said <laughs> buying both mounts took away like 30% of my total wealth. So I did not need to eat stale bread. The Tyranodon Mount. This is from an absurd amount of crafting and gathering in the firmament of Ishgard. For a while, this mount was so rare, I had to go to a JP server to find the only person that I knew of who had the mount for my mount video. The Tyranodon requires 500,000 points towards your Skyward score on it every single crafter and gatherer job. Now, a friend of mine, Vlithra, has gotten it and told me that it was probably about three months of grinding. The crafting part honestly aren't that bad, they said. It's the gathering part that takes time. And I asked, how many hours a day, like, would you say? This is an estimate, but I'd say around 550 to 650 hours, so around six to seven hours a day on average. I think that with the passing of time, more people have been able to get this mount, but it's still one of the rarest ones. Like if we're looking at FXV Collect, it's beat only by mounts that are unobtainable. I mean, it represents this colossal achievement and that's why it's really cool. For me though, I don't really craft or gather hardcore. So if I were to get it, I guess my play style would have to drastically change. So those are the 10 sort of categories of things that I think are most impressive to flex with in Palmas 14. Do you have any of these? Are there any things that you think I should have included on this list that I did not? And why do you think that? Because I, I thought through this very carefully, you know, considering all the factors that I mentioned at the start of the video, it has to have long lasting prestige. It has to be not just rare, but also notable, recognizable, you know, so let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Let me know if maybe you have tips for other people that are going for some of this stuff. If you like this video, please consider supporting the channel on Patreon or on Twitch. You can also support the channel for free by clicking the subscribe button or by sharing this video with your fellow warriors of light. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.